I'm Dr. Orion Taraban, and this is Psych Hacks, Better Living Through Psychology. And the topic of today's short talk is how to see God if you don't believe. So this is something of an ambitious topic. I want to begin by saying that there are many different paths to seeing God and that this might be one of them. Now, this talk is explicitly directed towards those folks who are agnostic or atheistic. My understanding of these folks is that they look around and they don't see any proof that God exists. And consequently, they find it very difficult to believe in something that they can't see or experience themselves. And it's like, fair enough. Without an experiential relationship or without any empirical evidence, God really does seem like a fairy tale. Like it's a make-believe idea that, I don't know, comforts deluded people who may not have the strength to confront reality on their own terms, possibly. But today, I'm going to help these folks approach the idea of God. And I'm going to do this by taking a roundabout route. We're going to leave the issue of whether God exists to the side for now and spend some time on a seemingly completely unrelated topic, namely the issue of whether you exist. And I don't mean you, the man or woman that other people can plainly see. I mean you, the self that you experience yourself to be. The thought experiment goes something like this. Imagine you're visited by an alien from another planet. This entity doesn't know what Earth is or who people are. To this entity, you are clearly alive, like a tiger or a monkey or a whale is alive. But the entity doesn't see you as, well, you. How would you prove to this entity that the self that you experience yourself to be exists. As we'll see, it's actually going to be pretty difficult. And to play out this thought experiment, I'll play the part of the entity. You might be dismissive at first, like, what are you talking about, Orion? I'm right here in front of you. You can plainly see me. Of course I exist. And I, the entity, might counter, well, I see a human animal, an organic organism comprised of tissues and cells. But I don't see a self anywhere. In which part of you is your self located? When I look at your organs, I see only tissues. When I look at your tissues, I see only cells. When I look at your cells, I see only molecules. When I observe your processes, I see only chemical reactions and electric impulses. When I scan you with x-rays and high-frequency magnets and electrodes, I see nothing that I can identify as a self in any part of your physical substrate or in any process contained therein. And you might argue something like, well, what about my DNA sequence? Huh? That's uniquely me. And I would counter, yes, that is unique, but your DNA is not you in any meaningful sense of that word. Like, can your DNA tell me that you love true crime documentaries or that you have unresolved feelings for your ex or that you cry more, than, more when you're happy than when you're sad? You don't even know what your DNA sequence is. And you certainly don't relate to yourself like an inanimate string of amino acids. And then you might say something like, well, I'm talking to you right now. La, 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 la. And I'm clearly making purposeful communication. Who else could be doing that if not me? And I might counter, well, you are clearly making sounds, but <laughs> I'm from another planet. This sounds like the clicking of dolphins or the chirping of birds to me. Your communication could just be the instinctual response to stimuli. Birds chirp because they're birds, after all, not because there is a little bird self inside them that loves to sing. And then you might say, well, come on, look, I have an ID. I've got a birth certificate. I've got a social security number. You can see it right here. That's my name. Other people clearly see that I exist. What's wrong with you? But I would argue that those are all scriptural arguments written by people who already believe that you existed. They are hardly trustworthy sources because they already see you as a self for some reason, and that's what motivated them to issue those documents. And this can go on and on. The fact is that there's actually no empirical evidence you could give that would prove that you exist as the self that you experience yourself to be. 
And that's what make this, makes this argument so frustrating. Like we would be appalled and horrified if someone denied our selfhood. But the fact of the matter is that I can't see yourself. I can't feel yourself and I can't experience yourself. I just kind of assume that you have a self because I have an experience of self. But of course, a non-human entity might not have a human experience of a self and so may not assume that one exists in us. Now, before I go any further, if you're liking what you're hearing, please consider sending this episode to someone who might benefit from its message. It's word of mouth referrals like this that really help to grow the channel. And you can also hit the super thanks button and tip me in proportion to the value you feel you derive from this episode. I really appreciate your support. But now let's keep going. Now, if I, the entity, were to come down from outer space to observe humans the way we might observe ants or cranes or mackerel, then over time, I would likely become increasingly puzzled. And that's because I would begin to notice that despite being nearly genetically identical, despite being, in many respects, phenotypically indistinguishable, certain individual humans behaved in meaningfully different ways. And if I were to observe these individual humans over time, then certain patterns to that behavior would start to emerge. And it would probably be very difficult to explain these patterns. Like, huh, that's odd. This individual human likes to walk alone by the water. But this individual human likes to spend time in crowded places with loud modulated sound frequencies. And this individual human spends hours staring at thin strips of processed pulp covered in lines of dried ink. And if I open them up or run them through a scan or examine their genetic sequences, I wouldn't find anything that would reliably predict or explain those patterns of behavior. It would just seem kind of random and mysterious. However, If I were to posit the existence of an abstraction, like, say, personality, that I could not directly observe, but if I were to assume its existence, would explain my observations, then suddenly all that chaos and randomness would snap into order. Like, oh, this person walks alone by the water because he's an introvert, and This human spends time in crowded places because she is sociable. And this person stares at ink because he's an intellectual. Everything starts to make sense. Keep in mind that there is no empirical thing as introversion or sociability or intellectualism. And keep in mind that these abstractions were circularly defined by the effects they are purportedly imputed to cause. Notwithstanding, We accept the concept of personality because it's incredibly useful for a number of reasons. In the first place, it makes otherwise inexplicable and chaotic behavior ordered and meaningful. And this makes interacting with these individuals significantly easier because, among other things, you can increasingly predict their future behavior. And it's these patterns of being, say, that you tend to like scary movies or that you commonly have trouble falling asleep because you're worrying about the future or you generally give people the benefit of the doubt. It's these patterns of beings that largely constitute your own experience of yourself. So does personality exist? Well, we could argue that there is absolutely no empirical evidence to support the idea that it does, and that it is only a mental construct that we invented to make sense of the observable behavior of others. But we could also argue that due to its consistency and predictive ability, it would be really weird if it didn't. Great. Now let's revisit the question of the existence of God. Obviously, there is nothing that you can see or touch that you can point to and say, that's God just like you can't point to a cell or a bile duct or a toenail and say, that's me. God is not a tree or a mountain or a galaxy. 
And God definitely doesn't show up on any of our empirical instrumentation, but again, neither do you. God doesn't appear on an MRI any more than you do. And God can't even be reliably identified from processes. What one person views as intentional communication, like speech or intelligent design, another person might consider the dumb unfolding of mechanistic laws, like the chirping of birds or evolution. And we certainly can't prove God's existence from scriptural evidence. That was written by people who already believe, just like you can't demonstrate that you have a self just because you have a driver's license. And without God, the universe seems chaotic, unpredictable, and random, just like humans seemed before we posited the existence of personality in our thought experiment. However, as soon as we begin to recognize the existence of stable patterns, and there are obviously stable patterns in the observable universe, just as there are stable patterns in individual behavior, we can consider the possibility that an unobservable and potentially non-empirical entity is responsible for generating the patterns that we see, like self or God. And we can also conclude that on the balance of probability, it is far more plausible that the assumed self exists than doesn't exist due to its consistent predictive power. Like, without the concept of I, explaining why anyone did anything would be a futile and frustrating exercise. These concepts bring order to an otherwise chaotic profusion of phenomenon, and they allow us to interact with other people in the universe in meaningful ways. Now, is God these patterns, or even the sum total of these patterns in the observable universe? No, because there is no pattern that can contain the pattern maker. Just like the sum total of all your personality components is not you, the sum total of, say, all the laws of physics is not God. Being an introvert, or more to the point, being an introvert and an intellectual and a masochist and an idealist and ad infinitum, cannot possibly contain the totality of yourself, which, like a limit in calculus, infinitely recedes. So the existence of an abstraction like self or God always requires a leap into the infinite, which, since it cannot really be comprehended by the human mind, is essentially an act of faith. It is an act of faith for me to believe that you exist in the same way that it is an act of faith for me to believe that I exist or that God exists. And though the data clearly trend in that direction, we actually can't arrive at that destination on a bridge of empiricism. It requires a leap that can never be substantiated. But I would argue the payoffs are well worth it. So we see that the question of the existence of God is actually very intimately related to the question of the existence of yourself. It's interesting. The same arguments can be used to prove and disprove both entities. And just like once you see yourself, you cannot ever unsee it, on some level, once you see God, you can never unsee it. Indeed, once seen, both seem the plainest facts of existence, in no small part because you realize that you had been looking right at them the entire time. What do you think? Does this fit with your own experience? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've gotten this far, you might as well like this episode and subscribe to this channel. You may also consider becoming a channel member with perks like priority review of comments or booking a paid consultation. As usual, thank you for listening.